Greetings and welcome back to room 303 AP English, the Roberts Lectures. We are in the poetry section and we turn now to Thomas Hardy's channel firing of 1914. Now, of course, Thomas Hardy is an important writer for us in 303. We've, of course, uh, studied Darkling Thrush as well as uh, Who's Digging? Are You Digging on My Grave? Both of these, of course, we've taught and lectured at LearnStrong.net. Five other poems in the Robert section from Hardy, which tells you how important he is. Um, the, the Breaking of Nations on page 985, Convergence of Twain in page 800, The Man He Killed, 656, uh, Ruined Made on 728 in the Workbox on 832. So uh, we should point out, uh, Thomas Hardy, not just an important novelist, but as well an important poet. And we're going to see that again in this, in this poetry an experimenter with the poetic technique. Now, the thing I want to concentrate on as we get ready to read this poem at 2B, so write this down. I want to concentrate on the three speakers of this poem, and I want to concentrate on what Hardy is saying about war. Hardy the great pacifist, Hardy the great pessimist, Hardy the great critiquer of the human condition that would produce the first, the great war. Uh, I want to comment about all three of these speakers and what exactly is going on. Let's now just read the poem. I'm going to use a professional reader here, and uh, this is Richard Burton reading uh, Channel Firing. That night your great guns unawares shook all our coffins as we lay and broke the chancel window squares. We thought it was the judgment day and sat upright while dreary summer rose the howl of wakened hounds the mouse let fall the altar crumb, the worms drew back into the moles, the glebe cow drooled, till God called, No, it's gunnery practice out at sea, just as before you went below, the world is as it used to be. All nations striving strong to make red war yet redder, mad as hatters they do no more for Christy's sake than you who are helpless in such matters. That this is not the judgment hour for some of them's a blessed thing, for if it were they'd have to scar hell's floors for so much threatening. Ah, it will be warmer when I blow the trumpet, if indeed I ever do, for you are men and rest eternal sorely need. I wonder, will the world ever saner be, said one, than when he sent us under in our indifferent century. Many a skeleton shook his head. Instead of preaching forty year, my neighbor, Parson Thirty, said, I wish I'd stuck to pipes and beer. Again the guns disturbed the hour, roaring their readiness to avenge, as far inland as Sturton Tower and Camelot and Starlit Stonehenge. All right, let's turn now and look at specifically how this poem is constructed around the essence of speakers. Now, of course, let's say it out loud. We are practicing for war, and the shelling is happening, and because the shelling is happening, now there's a certain kind of fear that begins to ripple across. Notice, we'll begin with the first speaker. The skeleton, the ghosts, that night your great guns underwear shook all our coffins where we lay. Often in churches, people would be buried or close nearby. We thought it was the judgment day. In other words, it's the end of the world because God is now coming back in Christian theology. And all the skeletons are the ghosts set upright. While Drearison against the how, Allen Ginsberg will use this word how, we've talked about it in relationship to our study of Conrad and Heart of Darkness, of wakened hounds, the mouse, the worms. In other words, nature awakens to this studying of this, of this bombing. Then it will be God who will be the, the second speaker, right? No, God speaks. It is, it, 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 it's not the judgment day. It's gunnery practice out at sea. We will immediately at 3A remind ourselves that the end of Golding's Lord of Flies will play the exact same game. The notion that men are preparing for war, for the devastations of war. Notice God here and the tone of voice. God says, no, no, we're just practicing for the next great war. Just as before you went below. In other words, it seems like nothing has changed. Hardy's observation that it seems like nothing seems to change. 
the human condition, mutually assured destruction, would be what it would be called later in the 20th century, MAD, M-A-D, right? We'll even get to the word MAD here in a, in a bit, right? The world is as it used to be, all nations striving strong to make red war yet redder. We'll, we'll, we'll of course think of any number of writers, nature, red in, claw and tooth and fang and all of that. Mad as hatters, they do no more for Christy's sake than you who are helpless in such matters. I think this word helpless is maybe the key word of the entire poem, so let's note it. That is to say, this is happening and there's not much anybody can do to prevent it. That this is not the judgment hour for some of them's a blessed thing. In other words, the comment here is that humans are so bent on destruction, on creating their own hell, they don't want to go to a, a hell somewhere else. Better, Satan's, Milton Satan says in Paradise Lost, better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. That notion that they're not yet ready to go. Ha ha, he says, it will be warmer when I blow the trumpet. If, notice the parenthetic, if indeed I ever do. There's the pessimism of Hardy, the agnosticism of most theologians of the day who were not certain that they could fully believe in a God of love given all of the catastrophes that were about to happen, of course, in the first 20 years of the 20th century, right? So down we lay again. The third speaker is a parson, right? I wonder will the world ever saner be? We're back to the mad notion again, said one. Uh, uh, then when he sent us under in our in different century. Go back and look at Darkling Thrush, the comments that we've made at LearnStrong.net in the Senior B folder on specifically Hardy and the Darkling Thrush. And the idea of the, uh, the fact that the century, the 19th century had ended and the 20th century was ready to begin and everybody was hopeful, but Hardy had a dark pessimism about what was about to happen. Of course, unfortunately, he was in many ways proved right. Instead of preaching 40 year, my neighbor Parson thirdly said, I wish I'd stuck to pipes and beer. Now this 40, of course, will remind us that Jeremiah and the great prophet will have preached for 40 years and never have purportedly gained a single convert. He says, I, I probably should have just been a partier and, and sat in bars instead of trying, trying to promote Christ's message of peace, if you will. And again, the guns disturb the hour, roaring their readiness to avenge. It's powerful that the last word here, of course, Stonehenge, one of the famous landmarks uh, for England, and yet also symbolically many have seen it as a place of sacrifice. At 2A, well obviously war is insanity. Nothing it seems has changed from past to the present and then obviously into the future. At 2B, the symbolism, the religious symbolism, and of course the voices notice of God in a parson here, as well as the referencing of Stonehenge, the notion that it seems like time doesn't seem to change much in terms of the human condition and our proclivities to resolve conflict vis-a-vis -vis war. At 3A, well, obviously, this poem will resurrect all of the great epics that celebrate war, the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid. I say celebrate, go back and take a look at all of our lectures on those great epics of warfare. It is fair to say that they celebrate war, but it's also fair to say that they celebrate the fact that war is a destroyer of all that we love, no doubt. Of course, we can also think about the great anti-war poems of, of Owen Sassoon, and then obviously Hardy's The Man He Killed. But I mentioned Lord of the Flies, and I think this is a poem that has to be read with our study of Golding's Lord of Flies, no question. Finally, at 3B, the question we ask in our study of Golding, do you think humans will ever find a way to be able to live beyond war, to resolve conflict beyond war, and finally find peace? Well, thank you, Thomas Hardy, for another challenging offering.